That is God's prediction, God's announcement of the coming of Christ. Let's celebrate the coming of our King and the reigning of our King as we now turn in our hymnals to Selection 63. Selection 63. All hail the power of Jesus' name. We'll sing all four stanzas and let us stand to sing.
explain why we have a large water bottle out in front of the church. And that is because, once again, we are asking for help with the sister project in Northeast Brazil. Now, some of you all uh, worshiping with us online may not know about this, so let me give you a little background. Uh, Northeast Brazil is naturally a very dry place during most of the year. Uh, because the winds move from east to west in the southern hemisphere, it's a little bit like what happens in our own country on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains. The mountains act as a rain shadow. And so when the clouds come over, all the water gets drained out from the coast, and then there's a long period of uh, semi arid area on the eastern side of those mountains. Well, that's the way it is in Brazil, except their mountains are right up next to the coast. And so most of northeast Brazil is very dry. And they do get rain a couple of months out of the year. So it is helpful for the people to be able to have cisterns in order to have water to drink the rest of the year. Now we discovered a large cistern uh, near the manse when we did a tree removal project recently. And the, the cistern at the manse was, what, 16 feet deep and 10 feet across. It was huge. That's the kind of thing that is being constructed for families in Northeast Brazil. And so um, if we can help with this, we're working with uh, our partner denomination, the Independent Presbyterian Church of Brazil, and they're in turn working with the government of Brazil and also the Roman Catholic Church's uh, Diagonal Foundation. And so uh, we know the money will get where it's going. We've been down, I've been down in Northeast Brazil, and some others here have as well. But we know that the money is used wisely and the need is great. So we certainly encourage people to help with that. Uh, if you'd like to help, just send your check to First Presbyterian Church market uh, sister fund. Also want a quick note, we'll give a little more information on this next week. Uh, you may have heard this past week about a large explosion near, uh, in, right in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, it was right near the port facility and 150 people were killed, uh, 5,000 people were injured, and uh, we're learning that over 300,000 people in the city are now homeless. So we, again, we have a connection to the church in uh, Beirut, Lebanon, and we can get funds uh, to the people who need it. So if you'd like to help with that, uh, again, send your check to the First Presbyterian Church in Market Beirut Relief. And uh, again, we we'll have more information on that in the weeks to come. But let's be in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Northeast Brazil. They're wrestling with the COVID uh, problem just as we are. And uh, our brothers and sisters in Lebanon who are wrestling with that. And we have a lot of economic turmoil, and now with this huge explosion. So uh, we have a lot of things to pray about and a lot of ways that we can help. So, with all of that in mind, let's uh, prepare our hearts for prayer as we take up our hymnals. We will turn to selection 73. Again, this is a hymn meditating on the fact that Jesus is our King and uh, remembering that He is willing and able to help us in so many ways. Sing all five stanzas of him, seventy three, and let us stand to sing.
And so let us continue then in prayer. Jesus did miracles. And 
so, Lord, help us to expect great things from you. And help our expectations, Lord, to be in line with, with your promises. Help us, Lord, to trust you no matter what happens because we know you have come to be with us in the person of Jesus Christ. And we offer this prayer in his name and for his sake. Well, we continue our study today of Matthew's Gospel. We turn to chapter 4, and we'll pick up the reading in verse 12. This is the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. You remember he's been baptized by John. That happened back in chapter 3. And in the first part of chapter 4, he's preparing for ministry by going into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And now we see the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry. And we have, we have a summary of on some of the things that he would do the rest of those three years. So we'll read in verses 12 and 25, and this is the word of the Lord. Now, when Jesus had heard that John, that's John the Baptist, was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed in great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from the Capitals, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. That is God's word. And in the era of COVID-19, we have no difficulty understanding why great multitudes follow Jesus, do we? In spite of our amazing medical expertise and technology, we are still a long way from finding a cure for this virus. Indeed, viruses from the flu and the common cold to HIV and Ebola have befuddled our most knowledgeable doctors and researchers for years. Through their ease of mutation and their ability to hijack the body's own cells to reproduce themselves. So if we knew someone who could instantly cleanse us of viruses, not to mention someone who could heal epileptics and paralytics and those possessed by demons, if we knew someone who could do all of that with only a word or only a touch, well, I think we would all join the great multitudes in beating a path to his door. Now it's no wonder that crowds came to Jesus from as far away as Syria and the north and Judea and the south and even across the Jordan River to the east. But they were not just coming to Jesus for healing. They were coming to him because of what all of that healing proved about him, that he was the Messiah predicted by so many of the Old Testament prophets, such as Isaiah, that we read this morning responsibly. 
Now, what did Isaiah say about this Messiah 700 years before Jesus was born? What did Isaiah say, for example, in chapter 35, when he said the Messiah would come to reveal the glory of the Lord and the majesty of God? Isaiah said this, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy. That's exactly what Jesus did, isn't it, throughout his healing ministry? His miraculous power over even the worst diseases made it obvious that he was the one Isaiah was talking about. He was the one for whom God's people had been waiting for so long. That meant the multitudes had great expectations beyond just being healed. For you see, they were also hungry to be set free from the power of their enemies. They were longing for God to administer justice to those like the Romans who had been oppressing them for so long. And Isaiah said that's the, the Messiah would do that as well. He said this in chapter 35. Take courage. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, and he will save you. That's what their expectation was. And just to make sure we understand that Jesus is, in fact, the long-awaited Messiah, in verses 15 and 16 of today's passage in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew quotes from our responsive reading from Isaiah chapter 9. In verse 4 of that chapter, God says that the one who will reign on the throne of David will break the yoke of his people's burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as in the battle of Midian. That's when Gideon won his great victory. For every boot of the booted warrior in battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, for fuel, for the fire. That was their expectation. And didn't John the Baptist say similar things about Jesus' might and majesty? What did we read back in chapter 3? What did John say? He who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's what John said about the Messiah. That's what Isaiah said about the Messiah. So there can be no doubt that the great multitudes were not just looking for healing. They weren't really just looking for freedom for their Roman overlords either. Oh, they had great expectations. They were longing for the day that the Messiah would rule in the righteous and just way that John and Isaiah had predicted that he would. What did Isaiah say? We usually read it at Christmas time, but it's true of Jesus all the time. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace from the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Yes. Great expectations. Now we know all of that is true. We've read all those beautiful prophecies we've heard, or perhaps even sung a handled setting of them many times at Christmas. We know who Jesus is. We know he is the promised Messiah. We know he is the child born to us. We know he is the son of David. We know he is the son of God. We know he was given up for us so that our sins might be forgiven. Oh yes, we know who Jesus is. But what are our expectations? What do we expect our Messiah to 
do for us. What parts of Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 9, for example, are we expecting Jesus to give us when we pray? We do pray to Him, don't we? And we do expect Him to do things for us, don't we? Especially during this COVID-19 crisis, we pray. We pray for health and healing for ourselves, for our loved ones. We pray that He will do away with this virus the way He did away with the Spanish flu of 1918. And during our recent economic shutdown, we've been praying that God would provide jobs for us and our loved ones. And as violence fills the streets of many of our biggest cities, we pray for safety for those who are caught in the crossfire. We pray for safety for law enforcement officers trying to keep the peace. We pray for justice for those who do harm to others. And I know parents and grandparents spend a lot of time on their knees praying for their children and their grandchildren, not just that they would be safe, not just that they would be healthy, that they would come to know the Lord and devote their lives to His service and the service of others. And there's nothing wrong with these kind of expectations. There's nothing wrong with praying for God to bless us in these or so many other ways. But what do we do when God doesn't grant our requests? How do we feel when a loved one is not healed? How do we feel when we see that death toll the virus go up and up and up? How do we feel when the job offer doesn't come through? How do we feel when a child goes astray? How do we feel when a relationship breaks down in bitterness? Isn't it easy in our disappointment to start doubting that Jesus really is the one John and Isaiah were talking about? When we lose the peace or the prosperity or the safety or the justice we pray, isn't it all too easy to doubt the promises that God has made to us? And perhaps we hedge our bets and we lower our expectations and we say, well, maybe, maybe I won't ask for that anymore. I'm sure that's a problem. Disappointment is a problem, but it isn't just a problem for us modern Christians. No, from the very beginning, Jesus was sending two seemingly contradictory messages. On the one hand, Jesus is making it obvious that he possessed endless power and authority. But on the other hand, he was making it equally clear that it was not his plan to make all the worldly circumstances of our lives perfect. In other words, he came to this world to bless us, yes, but not completely, not right now. And even for the people who saw him face to face during his first coming, many of his blessings were reserved for his second coming. And no, he didn't just hold out on those whose faith was somehow lacking. That's what you may have heard from the peddlers of the false health and wealth gospel. They say that all you have to do is speak a word of faith. Name a blessing and claim it from God and God will give it to you. If your faith is great enough. And of course, what better way would there be to demonstrate the strength of your faith than to send in a sacrificial donation? To pay for all that perfectly coiffed hair and capped teeth and private jets. You just have to have enough faith. But John the Baptist obviously had enough faith. He obviously believed in Jesus. In Matthew chapter 3, John confessed that Jesus was, in fact, the one. What did he say? He will be greater than I. What did he say? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And after John baptized Jesus over his strenuous objections, there was that voice from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. John knew who Jesus was. John believed. And yet, John was put in prison. Precisely because he had been so faithful to the truth. Precisely because he would not sugarcoat the need even for the most powerful people to repent and turn to God. Oh yes, John trusted Jesus. Oh yes, John publicly confessed his faith in Jesus. John gave himself completely to the service of God. But John ended up in prison. And Jesus never 
out. John died at the hands of a capricious, wicked ruler, and the son of David, the Prince of Peace, did not put a stop to that terrible injustice. And so we see in the very first verse of today's passage, verse 12, it should prove to us, Jesus did not, in fact, come to deliver all the promises of Isaiah 9 and 35. He did not come to grant everyone the help and the wealth and the peace and the prosperity and the freedom that we pray, at least not the way we think, and at least not right now. And that is why he did something else that was really strange. That is why he called the sorts of followers that he did. For you see, if the health and wealth preachers were right, if Jesus really had done what the great multitude expected him to do, if he had come to set up a worldly kingdom on this earth and to dispense all sorts of worldly blessings to us, well, he would not have done it this way. No. He would have conducted a royal progress through the land, recruiting only the bravest warriors and the wisest, most respected counselors to serve him. But in stark contrast to this, what do we see? The divine, miracle-working Son of God doing? He wanders by the seashore, and he calls four fishermen to be his first disciples. And you know, Matthew underlines this same point in verses 14 through 16, when he quotes from our responsive reading, when he quotes from Isaiah chapter 9. For you see, Jesus did not reveal himself in Jerusalem, the seat of religious and political power. Who no. knows? He allowed the light of God to shine first in Galilee. Really? Galilee of the Gentiles? Galilee of the nations? Galilee, the place where Jewish people had to live with those icky non believers? We would call it a sketchy neighborhood. Culturally marginal, suspect. Galilee was not the swankiest of addresses. And to those who live in Jerusalem, to those who consider themselves to be the good and the great, well, Galilee was <clears throat> unsophisticated at best, impure at worst. Much like those common, unlearned fishermen, Jesus called. Really? Really? For we cannot deny it. This passage proves it. So much of Jesus' life proves it. He did not come to promise his followers social standing or respect in the eyes of the good and the great, in the eyes of the powerful and the influential. He didn't. Moreover, he did not come to make sure that we are all financially comfortable. Or think about what he was calling just his first four disciples to do. These four young men. What did he ask them to do? He asked them to leave the only trade they knew. The only way they knew how to make any money. Moreover, he asked them to leave all their possessions behind them. Right? They left their nets. They left their boats. James and John had to leave their father, risking his disapproval and his disappointment, and who knows, maybe they were disinherited. Oh, and remember old John the Baptist, who preached Christ and ended up in prison? That's not exactly what the great multitude had in mind, was it? When they flocked to see Jesus. That's not exactly what those health and wealth preachers are promising, is it? But we cannot escape that rather sobering truth. If Jesus calls us to follow him, if Jesus calls us to believe his word, regardless of what the wealthy and the powerful may think of us, he also is calling us to radical dependence on him, regardless of the circumstances of our lives. Jesus is not promising to give us everything we want in this world, no matter what those TV preachers say. But he does promise 
to give us what we need in order to carry out the mission to which he has called us. And what is that mission? Well, what were the expectations of the great multitude? They wanted him to bring heaven to earth right then. They wanted him to bring an instant end to all the injustice and all the oppression right then. In much the same way as so many of those impatient, angry, frustrated young people marching in our streets won't. But again, that is not, it's obviously not what Jesus had in mind. The health and wealth preachers, well, they think it's all about riches. It's all about gaining riches and happiness while they line their pockets with our gifts. But no. As we see in this passage, worldly wealth certainly wasn't high on Jesus' agenda either. Instead, he called Peter, Andrew, James, and John, these very common working guys. He said, Quit fishing for fish and start fishing for men. In other words, he asked them to give up their focus on material blessings and to seek instead to draw others to Christ, to seek to help others to see Jesus for who he really is. And you know, I think Isaiah hints at that same point in chapter 9. You know, the verse that Matthew quotes in verse 16. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. See that? Because the truth is that Jesus did not come to destroy the darkness, at least not completely, at least not until he comes again. That's when he'll finally fulfill all the rest of Isaiah chapter 9 and chapter 35 and all the rest of those. That's when he'll finally bring all the health and the wealth and the peace and the prosperity and the justice and the righteousness that we bring. But for now, he has come to shine a light into the darkness. He has come to shine a light into the darkness. And he calls all who follow him to do the same thing. For no matter what, the great expectations were of that great multitude. We are not all to serve the Prince of Peace by fighting for him with swords and spears or with angry words and violent deeds. You cannot serve the God of love with hate. No, Jesus calls us instead to be fishers of men to present the claim to Christ and then patiently wait for those in darkness to come to the light, that we are steadily, faithfully, patiently, truthfully shining. It's not our job to force the issue. It's not our job to try to tell everyone to see things our way. It's not even our job to fix everything that's wrong with the world. It is enough for us to show the world who Jesus is with our lips as well as with our lives. To love those around us while we tell them the good news of God's grace. And so, in starting his ministry in Galilee, and in calling four fishermen to be his first disciples, Jesus challenges a lot of our expectations, doesn't he? He proves that following him is not about being respected or influential. It's not about being healthy or wealthy. It's not about being forceful or powerful. And if that's what you want, you need to go find another preacher, one with a lot more hair, to tell you the lies you want to hear. For the truth is that following Jesus simply means sharing the same gospel that John preached and that Jesus preached. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Following Jesus means living a life of repentance. It means calling others to do the same thing, to kneel before the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Because no matter how dark, no matter how chaotic this world may seem, the truth is 
that Jesus already reigns on the throne of David and over his kingdom. We are simply called to show the light of that truth, to show the light of his love into the confusion and the hatred of all around us, to announce the free gift of his gracious pardon, even, even to self-centered sinners like us, even if they're not particularly interested, at least not at first. That's who Jesus is. Regardless of our great expectations, that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Will we follow him? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for revealing yourself to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for calling us to follow him. Lord, we confess that following Jesus isn't always what we want it to be. Help us to be faithful. Lord, instead of trying to figure it all out for ourselves, instead of trying to make conditions on our allegiance, help us simply to acknowledge that Jesus is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Son of David, the King of Kings, and the Prince of Peace. Help us to live as his followers, showing others the light. For we pray this in his name for his sake. Our closing hymn is number 440. You can also find the words in your order of service, online order of service. This is a hymn of Fanny Crosby's. And she certainly, her life didn't turn out the way she thought it would at first. Uh, Fanny Crosby went blind. And yet she spent most of her life, even after losing her sight, she spent most of her life writing poems and hymns of praise to the God who she trusted so much and loved so much. So let's challenge one another to follow the Lord Jesus as we take up our hymnals and turn to 440, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. We'll sing all three stanzas and let us stand to sing.
May that not just be our song, may that be our life this week, that we would trust Jesus to lead us all the way, regardless of where his path might be. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, through the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and now.